Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Happiness in Higher Ed podcast. My name is John Hill, and I use he, him pronouns. Uh, And today's guest is I have Taylor Way here. And before I formally introduce her, as I've always done with everyone else, I will read off our mission statement. So in a world that can be engulfed in darkness, we must shine bright and lead the change for a better future. As we continue to shape and challenge emerging adults' minds, it is also our duty to reflect and remember what makes us happy and why we continue to do the work that we do. So without further ado, I will formally introduce Uh, Taylor Way. And Taylor is an internship program coordinator for the Washington Internship Institute in Washington, D.C. She is passionate about championing, 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 championing. Okay. I was like, I'm not sure if that sounds right when I'm saying it. So I've had a couple, I've had issues reading the bios over the past couple of weeks. It's totally fine. We we roll with it. We roll with it. (laughs) Students to stay unfinished as they navigate their journey through higher education and beyond. During her downtime, she enjoys reading at a park or beach, spending quality time with friends and uncovering hidden gems of the United States Capitol. Would you like to add anything else, Taylor? Uh, Just that I'm really stoked to be here. I appreciate you having me on, John. Nice. Well, I am stoked to have you here. So um, without, we're just going to roll into the questions then if that's cool with you. Totally. All right. So the first question that I have for you is what was the reason you started to pursue a career in higher education? Yeah. So um, growing up, my mom worked in higher education, actually. She um, was in advancement. So that's fundraising. And she had a really great college experience. Um, She went to like Illinois Wesleyan University, which is a small liberal arts college um, in the town that I grew up in. So um, and she also worked there. So I was sort of around the college scene for most of my formative years. And um, it was always a conversation at the dinner table. My mom was always like, this is going to be the best four years of your life. Um, Always give back to your alma mater. I mean, she had like she was raw, raw for college. And so I think that that (laughs) rubbed off on me a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so I just remember really wanting to get through high school and go to college. And, um, once I went, I chose a small liberal arts school, um, similar to hers. It's Augustana college in the quad cities, um, of Illinois. And, um, it was a really great experience. Um, I really knew that I had to go into it making the most of it. And so one of the things that I did um, was do a travel abroad experience. And um, at Augustana, it's really cool. They have this thing called Augie Choice, which is about $2,000 that's set aside for um, each student that is currently enrolled that they can use to then apply to um, a study abroad opportunity. Now, that doesn't cover like the whole cost, but you know, $2,000 is a good chunk of change. In Pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so I decided to go to um, Sydney, Australia. And yeah, I interned okay. at a small college um, similar to Augustana called Australian Catholic University. And I worked with the international student advisor. And I think that that experience really affirmed my wanting to work in higher education because I traveled so far and it was my first time away from home and out of the country really by myself and, you know, putting all of my skills that I had learned in college and understanding the business world to good use. And I was just so welcomed and I was so valued as an intern that I was like, I can't believe that I can go this far away from home and still be welcomed and valued this way. So that really, I think, sparked it for me. And then when I came back to college, I um, really got in with our program coordinator who does or did study abroad at the time. His name was Kevin. And I did like an experiential internship for him and um, really was like, oh, okay. So student affairs is where I want to be. This is the fun side. This is, you know, what I, what I want to do. This is, you know, the functional kind of part of higher education that made my experience so enriching, you know, mm-hmm. outside of the classroom. Um, I did a lot of things um, in higher education and during my four years. So um, I think that affirmed it for me, but I didn't really understand what student affairs was. So I really thought that I could like, graduate and be a guidance or not a guidance counselor, but like an admissions counselor. Right. Mm -hmm. And like, I thought that that was sort of an entry level position that I was qualified for. And when I was throwing out resumes and, you know, trying to get my foot in the door, I just wasn't going anywhere. I was coming up short and I decided to do a graduate, um, 
experience at Western Illinois University in their college student personnel program. Um, and John was my cohort mate, <laughs> um, along with many other guests of the podcast thus far. Um, but I really took that experience and tried to understand what student affairs was and why it was so important to have a degree in it. And I think, you know, now looking back, I can't believe I thought that I could do the work that I wanted to do before getting that degree. And so I think those two experiences really affirmed, were affirming for me personally, but also professionally. And that's really why I wanted to get in to student affairs because it was so transformative for me. And if I can be a part of that for somebody else, then it's totally worth it. Got you. So then you, so the connection that you made at the, like, while you were in the program and after the program is that you felt that like going into a grad program that you had those experiences that made you a better professional. Do you think that if you were given that opportunity to have a job without having that master's degree, do you think that you still would have been good in that position? Or do you think that it's, it's beneficial to go and get a, a master's degree in higher education before starting a role? Cause I know that the, some people do both. Um, some have started and then got the degree. Some have gotten the degree and then go into it. So what is your take on that, I guess? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, that was obviously something that was important and that I needed in my journey. I don't necessarily think that, you know, in, in any sort of job that you need a formalized education to do well. I think that there are various types of learning styles and it doesn't all fit in the brick and mortar of a higher education institution, be that a community college or an Ivy league or anything in between, you know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. um, I, I think for me, it was, it was impactful because I needed that experience to really teach me the person that I wanted to be and how to show up for students. But I, I don't necessarily think that that is something that everyone needs. Um, and maybe that's not, you know, great to say, but I, I, I think that, um, you know, depending on your background and how involved you were and, and where your passion area lies and your lived experience, you don't necessarily need a formal education to be an expert at something. Got you. No, that was not a question that I had, but I just, as you were talking, that's just something that I thought about, you know, when you had mentioned that you had submitted those resumes and stuff. So, yeah. but no, but thank you. So the next question that I have for you is loaded, this is loaded question. So what makes you happy in thinking about one thing from higher ed and then one personal thing? Yeah, um, I think in higher ed, again, sort of going back to, you know, my experience of finding it so valuable to know how I wanted to show up in this role and um, in student affairs and what kind of practitioner I wanted to be. Um, I never, I always knew that I wanted to do it. My work had to ha be meaningful to me. I couldn't be the type of person who could push something that they didn't believe in, whether I was actually selling something or I was just helping people out. I needed to feel a conviction and a pride for the things that I am welcoming other people into and, and helping them with. And so I think for, for me, education has always been something that I find to be important and it's been talk to me is important. And again, not necessarily formalized education, but all, all types. And so I think that depending on your path and, you know, the students that do choose to pursue higher education, I, I want to be a champion for, for them and show up in the best way possible. Um, mm -hmm. And so it makes me happy when that is either recognized or they just, they feel like they can confide in me. I'm helpful. Um, you know, I'm learning from them. That is, that's an enriching experience for me. So that um, I think professionally makes me happy. Personally, lots of things make me happy. I think I am a, um, I tend to err on more of the positive side of things and I, you know, can be really bubbly and whatever, but mm -hmm. um, I think it's surrounding myself with good people. And I definitely find that I overlap that in my personal and professional life. I I really value human connection and, you know, in my friendships and, and personal or um, professional relationships. So I think having a good close network of friends and um, again, going through the graduate experience and having a cohort of people who really love to, to dive deep and, um, you know, have the same passion area that I do um, is really fulfilling and, you know, maintaining those relationships is something that's important to me as well. So being able to, to have a close network of friends who, you know, 
I pour into equally as much as they pour into me. And, you know, it's a really enriching sort of bond is makes me happy too. That's you. Nice. No, and I think that's, I think that's the, the key point that I find that what you just talked about specifically, like with the friends is the, that you have the ability that to they, for them to pour into you as well as for you to pour into them. And like how, um, I never really thought about like when, you know, teaching or learning about like healthy relationships and learning about how those dynamics work. I never really thought of it that way, but I think that's such a key, uh, key thing because I think that, I can think of a handful of relationships that I've had in my life with individuals that have been very much so one-sided. And I just thought that was the way it is, you know, but I think that that's, that's such a good thing to realize and to have in your life as you like get older, because I think that not saying that we're like super old, (laughs) but like, (laughs) you know, I think you hit a certain point where you're just kind of like, it has to be mutual because I think that that like they're draining, you know? And I think that that like, I, I, I can't speak for you, but like for my own personal experiences that like that kind of like takes away from my happiness um, with those with those relationships is just because it's not like fulfilling anymore. It's kind of just like another like, I think of it like a job responsibility, but it's not a job responsibility, but it's just kind of like a task that you have to like, it's always, you have to do something and it's like, it's just like, I'm drained now instead of having your cup filled up. So totally. And I also think that it's a part of a, of growing up and, and understanding friendships and relationships and what you want, um, just personally out of a connection with somebody else. I think, you know, when you're younger, you're friends with people mostly due to proximity, those who live in your hometown, who are your neighbors, who, Mm -hmm. you know, you see every day. Um, but when you're older, you kind of get to pick and choose who sticks around and why you like them and, you know, think about those things. And so, yeah, I think it's, it's all a part of growing up and, and learning and understanding who you are, but it's kind of a, it's a real gift. I think about growing up to be able to do that. And Mm -hmm. if you can identify that and, and value it, I think that it, it carries you pretty well throughout your life. Nice. No, I totally, I totally agree with that. So the third question that I have for you is what keeps you resilient and the, yeah, what keeps you resilient in the face of some of the challenges you face? So whether that be like budget cuts, stress from pandemic, I know that you recently have transitioned jobs. So like what, like adding that into that as well, you know? Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> <laughs> that I think is an even more loaded question for me personally, mm-hmm. just because of where I, I am now um, and, and what I had just recently gone through. I found that in my last role, I just didn't feel it to be as fulfilling as I, I wanted on, on multiple levels. And, and that's probably where I'll leave it. But I just remember being so unfortunately unhappy in my day to day. And I think that outside of the compartmentalization, I think that I had to implement um, when I really felt defeated um, about, you know, my job and and sort of where I was, um, was just being able to talk to my friends and family and articulate articulate what I needed, but also know that like, I wasn't alone. I think it was really not, you know, misery loves company. Right. And so if I could hop on a zoom and chat with someone I went to grad school with, we could really talk about our jobs in the industry and like what things were really bringing us down. And I think sometimes you have to get really dark before you can get light again, um, which might sound a little morbid, but I do think that just being, it's such a cathartic feeling to say what you're feeling and, and name it as Dr. Layla McLeod always says, um, Mm -hmm. and really identify, you know, what, what is wrong and have somebody else go, yeah, I'm feeling crappy about that too. And I think just being able to say it and, you know, sit in that together for a moment brings you back or at least it brings me back in a way that um, is refreshing. I feel like I've gotten something off of my chest or I have, I have taken some of that emotional burden that I think that I can keep inside and push down sometimes. Um, I've now said it out loud. And one, it's, it's always less scary than I think it is. Um, it's comforting to be able to confide in somebody else. Um, and, and it, 
for me, it quickly brings the positivity back around because it's just, I needed somebody to affirm whatever I was feeling, thinking, what have you. So that I think is a really important aspect for resiliency. I, I don't think that it's just this happy, you know, sunny disposition that you can have all of the time because, you know, we're most well, multifaceted human beings who have all kinds of emotions. And even if you feel like you are alone in, even during a global pandemic and, you know, a, a job shortage and all of those things. And, you know, you can really get inside of your head, but I think having the perspective of being able to go deep and really, really unpack the experience with somebody else makes it so much, so much lighter. Somehow after you unpack everything, what you pack back in is just not, not as heavy. And so I think that for me, that has been I, I've identified as I've gotten older that that is really something that I need. I'm an external processor. Like I have to, I have to talk with people. Um, and so like having, having a roommate like I do now, who's one of my closest friends, it's nice to be able to, you know, have those conversations, whether they be few and far between or all the time, depending on the situation, it's mm -hmm. just nice to be able to sort of, again, go deep and then come back up. And I, I always feel a lot better. So I think that that's, the biggest thing that keeps me resilient and, you know, looking, coming outside of yourself and looking, you know, to the left and right and really seeing that you're not the only person in, in the boat you're in at the time. Actually, no. And I think the, the one thing that I was thinking about, and uh, you had said this a little bit, a little bit ago and like the, the reaffirming. So having someone that is there to reaffirm what you were thinking, what you're feeling, what you're, what you're saying in a sense. And I wonder if that is like the, the shift that I've heard a lot with like, like, uh, like resiliency specifically is that like some of us or like our generation, like when we grew up, like it was kind of just like, we were not told to repress our emotions, but it's kind of just like, when we think about, oh, this is a terrible situation. And it's like, oh, everything's going to be fine. Like this is, everyone else goes through this. Like we're going to be fine. And like, let's move on. And like, it wasn't that the people in our lives were like dismissing our feelings, but it kind of just like, no one was like sitting there with us and being like, yeah, these are tough emotions to deal with. Or like, this is a terrible situation. And like, it's exhausting. Or like you, you, you probably need a little bit more of any, every, anything and everything in those moments that you have. And I wonder how that plays into now, how much we value like affirmation from other individuals. That's a yeah. loaded question and I just thought of it. No, 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 that's, that's a great point. And I think that's huge. I mean, I know that I'm not the only person who functions that way. Um, and I don't always need to function that way also, but I do think like growing up, you're right, there was, now that we've sort of identified it, but this toxic positivity around, you know, like just get in there and keep a smile on your face and, you know, rub some dirt on it and <laughs> keep going. And mm -hmm. um, that was definitely drilled into me as well. And I think, you know, I've, I've noticed at least being able to like, one of the people that I really confide in is my mom, um, mostly because as I mentioned, she was in higher education and still is. Um, but I've, I've, found that in my relationship with her, especially as an adult and getting to know her as an adult as well, and being able to better identify what I need from her, I've had to say like, I don't need a solution. I just need a sounding board. And I just need someone to be like, yeah, that really, that really sucks. And for her, I think, and I wonder if maybe as parents, again, I don't have kids, so I don't really know, but I would imagine that, you know, when your child comes to you in distress, that you want to help them and you want to, um, you know, make it go away for them as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. But that's, again, when you have an adult child, it's, it's almost like I have all of the tools. Like I, I know what you gave me and I know what I feel um, and what I'm going to do about it. I just need somebody to help me sort through my emotions, especially if you're an external processor. And so again, mm -hmm. maybe not everybody needs to do that, but I do think it's helpful sometimes if you're just keeping it all inside, you, you can't get the perspective that that you can with somebody else if you're just, you know, keeping it to yourself because you're not able to see it from, from different angles that other people are. And you only know your lived experience. It's helpful to have somebody else, mm -hmm. you know, talk about theirs. Yeah. And I, something that I, that I think about is that we we're working on in our office, we're working on a resiliency workshop and like 
even the phrase that I, I use it all the time and I had to catch myself is like, it is what it is. Like that is such a toxic positivity phrase. And it just like, instead of sitting there and like actually working through that, you know, having someone to talk through it and not necessarily like you had mentioned, like with your mom, like, I don't need you to solve this issue. I just need you to like, just to listen and be there and be present in the moment rather than, because I even wonder now that I'm thinking about it and saying that out loud, like, I wonder if that had, has anything to do with like the way that like of the timing piece of it of like it takes a lot longer to sit there and process things and like rather than getting a solution because I think like a solution is quick and I feel like it's just kind of like boom boom then we're done with it and then we move on and I wonder if that that had anything to do with it and I I don't know like (laughs) I'm like writing I'm like writing things out as I'm like talking through (laughs) yeah no I think that I've, I've found, and I don't know if this is what you're getting at, but like when I'm able to just like word vomit for lack of a better phrase Mm -hmm. out what I'm feeling and, and be really raggedy and like uncut about everything, just like let it spill out and be just a raw human for a moment. I am again, once it spills back out, like what I take back in is so much lighter and I'm able to find a solution so much quicker. I I feel so much better that I've done that. And, you know, I do think depending on the situation and how powerful your emotions are, not everybody can absorb that kind of emotion all the time. And so it's, it's also good to be a good steward of, you know, can you handle this right now? I'm, I'm in a bad place, but I don't want to contribute to, to your, you know, headspace if it's negative right mm-hmm. and so yeah. being able to to also um know know who and when you can you can be that way with is also important because you know if, if i think that goes so far and i do think that like therapy and counseling is something that is so uh crucial and i'm so happy that it's it's being talked about and more normalized um but you know i do think that sometimes that line can can be a little bit blurred, you know, you, you can lean on people for a lot in in friendships and, you know, different connections that you make, but sometimes it is important to also have that for your mental health and other folks, um, you know, the piece of having, um, a therapist or a counselor or just somebody else who, who specializes in that to really hear you out as well. I don't think that it's just one or the other. Um, is that sort of what you were getting at as well? Yeah, a little bit, a little bit on that, but I was thinking, as well, like, yes, and, you know, if we're going to, mm-hmm. if we're going to call, <laughs> you know, Chase yeah. Catalano, like, uh-huh. uh, with the and piece, uh, I was thinking a little bit about, like, the, the parent, like, our, like, adults capacity in that moment to even, like, be in that space, because they're also thinking about the thousand things that they have going on, or all the responsibility, because no one, <laughs> I think when we talk about, like, when we were younger or when I was younger, I would always talk about the, all the things that I was looking forward to as an adult. And now that I've seen a lot of the things that, that other responsibilities that you have as an adult, like, yeah, there's all the fun things that we talked about, but you know, there's like bills and like (laughs) responsibility and all these things um, of just like the time to sit with those emotions. And I think that like, I wonder if, like parents or authoritative figures or people that we looked up to if they didn't have that capacity to sit with us either or like to process with us like I think that's just you going back to the affirming of like you know now you have that ability to like to find people that can affirm you and like all that I wonder if that has something to play with it I know that's super meta in my <laughs> I mean it is but you know I love stuff like that and I, yes. I like living in the gray and the messiness um but I I also have talked to my mom about about just that I'm like you are so good at compartmentalizing your experiences and your feelings do you ever feel like you are pushing them down or do you can you truly like put it in a neat little box set it aside and only open it when you want to because I feel like compared to that I'm just a soupy casserole, right? Like it's just all, <laughs> I don't know how to contain. And I, and I think that that is true to an extent for our generation. We're just so much, we've created a culture where we can be so much more emotionally vulnerable with each other as a general rule that I wonder if it's a generational shift, you know, like at least from my mom's experience, she's like, I just, that's how I function. I don't, I don't know. And again, I don't know if it's the way that, you know, the opportunities that were available to her and the people that she surrounded herself with in her life. But 
she's really good at that. And I, mm-hmm. I mean, I don't see much, much of that from her, but for me, I'm like, I need to talk to you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's very, that's true. And I think that like you, you touched on that, like it's, it's a different, not a different, a different time, but I think that we just, like you had mentioned too, like we're having more of those conversations. We're being more vulnerable. And, you know, I remember having conversations with like you and Cecilia and, and Laura and like how like deep those got and like how it was more, you were saying things that like you had mentioned about being like your raw natural self, but like you knew that it wasn't going to be turned against you or like said in a negative light. Like it was just kind of like just a good moment to be a part of. So Renee always really gonna... found something with that vulnerability piece. <laughs> no, I think, I think it's very true. And like, you know, we talked to, talked about that um, last week with, with Jackie. And I think that that's, that's something very true is that like vulnerability piece, I think doesn't show, it doesn't show up in our lives until we let it. And then it just shows up in mag, like big magnified ways. So yeah, good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> good stuff. Great stuff. <laughs> um, Yeah. So the fourth question that I have for you is what are some of the ways that you practice self-care to stay on your A game? Yeah. Um, I think definitely I've reframed it recently. And, and I think that because it's the, you know, the whole trending self-care notion is, is quite new as far as mainstream pop culture goes. Right. And so I think when I used to think about it, I was like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to get fries on Friday. And that's going to be that's self-care because I'm treating myself and I deserve that. Or I'm, you know, going to take a bubble bath or I'm going to go on a trip or I'm going, they were all of these tangible things that I, I had already identified were treats or, you know, things that I would just, you know, give myself to make myself feel better. And I think that they're, those are, those are lovely ways to, to show love to yourself. But I I think that the whole self-care thing that I've realized is get as much as I'm getting older, not that I'm old, um, (laughs) (laughs) but as I get older and become more mature and, you know, understand what I really need, it's what is the root feeling that I get from ordering the fries or taking the bath or, you know, doing whatever I, I want to do that makes me feel better. It's just sparking joy in my life. And it's, it's also producing a, a calming factor for me. So I think that again, going back to, you know, our connections with other people, again, I really, you know, value my friendships and my family and, you know, the relationships that I pour into. And so I think that, you know, for self-care, I, I talk to, I talk to those people and I also have, you know, it's been different obviously this year with the pandemic. I think like as simple things like taking a walk have really helped. I've gotten into podcasts a little bit more. Um, I, let's see, what else have I done? I've, you know, started reading more than I, than I used to. And I know that you were talking about this, I think with Chase, Dr. Dr. Chase Catalano. Um, so formal. And, yes, yes, well, yes. Um, and it, those are just things that I think that, you know, I, I'm either rediscovering or, or picking back up, but it's, it's unhooking my mind, but also giving it nourishment. And I think that that's really where my self-care comes in. I want to check out, but I also want to check into something else that I think can be um, beneficial to me. And, and whether that's just, I'm listening to a podcast because, you know, that topic is something that, that brings me joy or, um, you know, I, 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 I'm working, but, you know, I'm feeling a little overwhelmed. I'm going to turn on happiness and higher ed podcasts and listen to that. And it's just a different, <laughs> you like how I plug that there. Thank you. I appreciate um, that. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's just one of those things where I think that you don't necessarily have to completely shut down. And I think before, because of being burnt out and overworked and just, you know, not implementing the proper self-care before this, um, I would think that like checking out was like my self-care, taking a nap, completely forget about it, forgetting about what I was doing. And I think that those at the time I was like, oh, this is me totally checking out and, you know, giving myself some self-care and turning off. But I think that those were more um, indicators of, of burnout, as I mentioned. And so doing things that are either still within 
the realm of what I'm focusing on, um, or, you know, just bringing me joy in other areas of my life. Like, I think that I've understood that at least for me, I have to, I can check out of something else, but I want to fill my cup in another area. And so again, that's, I think just something that's really important in any type of self-care that I do, but that's sort of the root of it for me. Got you. No. And I think that there was something that you had touched on too, that I, the, I think about that I want to do a little bit more of like research and like learn a little bit more about is like that, like dissociating. So like dissociation and like how yeah. scrolling through just a prime example, scrolling through TikTok for hours on end or like binge watching TV shows, like how creating those that we say that that's like, that is a form of self-care, but that's also a form of like kind of taking a break from our own reality, you know? And like, where's the, where's that fine line of, you know, like, like you had mentioned, like filling your cup up or like taking it, like, I wouldn't say it one step further, but just taking it to kind of like, just shutting everything off around you. And I like, such a fascinating thing to think about how you're just like, oh, I'm like filling my cup up, but then it's also kind of like, are you, or are you doing this? And I was just, just something to think about. <laughs> but it, it's almost like the, it's, it's like as a society being able to understand that social media is harming us in some ways. And yet we can also know, even if we see it all, we're still addicted to it, right? Like that, it, the social dilemma, that, that um, documentary that came out, I think a little over a year ago now, I'm, I'm not sure if you saw it, but it was basically mm -hmm. like highlighting, um, you know, that whole issue. And I remember <laughs> at the end, I was like, oh, like, we're not, we're not, even if we have all of the information, we're not necessarily still can think, become hmm? oh I, th I thought I, I think I lost you for a little bit but I think I think you're good now I think you're good sorry where did I cut off do you need me to rehash um that is a very great question I, I don't, <laughs> okay I don't well remember. I'll just summarize basically like okay. we're, we're not too smart to <laughs> to not fall <laughs> victim I suppose for lack of a better term to some of the things that we can identify are bad for ourselves. And I think social media is, is one of those, right? Like we, I still enjoy scrolling through Facebook and Instagram and Pinterest is really my, my weakness. <laughs> I do but, know this. I do yeah, know this. <laughs> you know, I'm a very Pinterest person. Um, but I have, you know, I'm like, oh, okay, well, I, I get that. Like, that is still something that brings me joy, but what if constructively now, like, I, I go on Pinterest and I look for recipes and I like plan to make those. And like, that's something that I can do outside of social media that still brings me joy and is, and is helping me have, be a better cook and have a repertoire if for nobody else myself, um, and make myself delicious food, because that also brings me joy. And that is, that is also self-care, right? That's mm -hmm. nutritious and delicious and all of that stuff. And like, I have the capacity to do that. That feels empowering. So I, it's, it's also just like reframing that, but yeah, we are not, we are not absolved from falling into those, those traps. Yeah. I think it's a fine line that we all, that we all walk. Mm -hmm. I think that, I think that it's, it's, tr it's tricky because like, as you had mentioned, you like with social media and things like that, but you use it in other, other forms. And I think that that's like a, that's a key component that like you have the ability to like define that where the, the line is, I guess, or like where, not where you stand on the line, but just kind of like when it turns into like a not so self-care thing, I guess. Totally. You're not completely out of control. You do have, you can take back some power there. Yeah. So I, once again, I, I knew I was probably going to get meta with you because that is, that is so true because most conversations that we have, it's, yeah. uh, and we, and we've even laughed about this before is that like, usually like the first hour of our conversation that we have is like checking in and then all of a sudden we'll get like this huge, huge idea. And then all of a sudden, like two and a half hours later, we're just like, oh, okay, here we are. <laughs> yes, we really drop deep and come back up. You're one of those people that I can do that with. Yes. So, and I, and I appreciate that. So, yeah, same. but, uh, the last question that I have for you, um, is what is one piece of advice you live by in your practice? It's gonna, everyone in our cohort is going to roll their eyes, but I'm going to say it because I believe that, <laughs> um, <laughs> mine is really stay unfinished, right? Like don't, you don't have it all figured out there. It is so 
important to, at least for me and my own convictions and my own beliefs to, to stay open to different ideas and truths and, and ways of life that, that shape my understanding of the world. I would rather turn to wonder, again, another quote by Dr. Layla McLeod, um, than just say, I, I, I have the answer because I think in my own life, I've, I've encountered folks who, who have that mindset. And again, in turning to wonder, I, I, I try to understand how they came to that. And I think that I have the opportunity being able to identify that in myself and find value in it. Like I should really live with conviction first, like first and foremost, I think definitely in my professional life, but also in my personal life, I believe to sort of stay open and um, just always learn, continuously be a student of the world, of other people, of, of everything. And I think that you just get a more enriching time on this earth than the latter. No shade to, to other people who don't, but that's just mm -hmm. you know what I believe and to be true. Yeah, because everything's ever evolving. And I think that if you have that ability to stay, like to, to, to have that desire to be unfinished and to like do that in your practice, I think that it's always like, you take it as like a, uh, like an exploratory way of saying, oh, I didn't know, like, you know, five years ago, we were, it was okay to say this word, or it was okay to do this. And like, now it's not, whereas like, you don't become so fixated on like, in the past, this is the way that it was, you know, like, and then instead of becoming hyper-focused on that, you get hyper-focused on, or not really hyper-focused, but you get, you attach onto the idea that things can change, things can evolve, and like you said, stay unfinished. Yeah, so. and I think that as, as well, like, this past year has just affirmed that, like, being open and bouncy is a little bit better because things can change really at any time and life as you know it can change at any time and I feel like the world at least from you know where I sit has been turned upside down for the first time in my own lived experience but it, but it's also been enriching to to turn to older generations and younger generations just to see how they're experiencing it as well because I think that this will be our first moment of change, but it won't be our last moment of change. You know, like there are, there are big world events that, that have happened where I think it has changed the course of history. And this is one of them, but being open to what comes next and how you show up and, you know, rethinking how you move about the world is, is helpful. And if nothing else, the, the adaptation of the new normal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I totally, I totally agree with that. So well, that, you, has anyone asked you that question? Which question? Um, yeah, what do you, what is one like quote that you live by or one condition that you live by in your, in your practice? I know that Tony has, and, or Tony did, and I, I, and so did Nat, and it was kind of like the idea of, um, now that I'm probably, I'm probably not going to say it correctly, um, <laughs> but with Tony, I was talking about how to always bring others up. And I never really under understood what that meant until you have the ability to see kind of like for me specifically about like how like privilege plays out in different situations and like in the, in the, in the room and how you can use your privilege to help others and to like be the agent of change, I guess is, a, is the best way that I'll describe it. Um, but another piece of advice that I live by is that the, the goal is not happiness. The goal is peace. Because I think that sometimes when we get into the, the trap of that we always have to be happy, I think that it becomes, it can easily slip into something that's toxic. Whereas like, if you find a place of peace and you have that baseline of where you feel your best, then you have the ability to see how other things are like um, interrupting that piece or like taking advantage of that piece. So like, whether that be like relationships, whether that be jobs, whether that be, um, obligations like you have the ability to be like I don't want to hang out with this person anymore I need to take on less responsibility right now or shift responsibility or I don't want to go to those obligations like sometimes like you just want to not do anything you know and the value that 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 the empowerment that you have from that I think is just exponential to the idea that you always have to be in a good mood because I think that sometimes you can you can be at a point of peace but like processing something whereas like with being happy I feel like sometimes it impedes on that process of processing whatever you're going through because then it just 
it's just, you become so hyper-focused that like, I can't do this right now because I have to be, I have to be happy. I have to put on a smile. Whereas if you just say that you're at peace, then it's, it's such a better feeling. So. Oh yeah. Right on, man. <laughs> I want to live a peaceful life. I buy it. Yeah. yeah. Cause I think that you don't have to strive for, I feel like with happiness, it's, it's like external and like peace is internal. Um, mm-hmm even though you can get happy. I'm on a podcast called happiness and higher ed. And I'm like explaining that, like no happiness, don't be happy. Um, but I think that like, sometimes we, with happiness for me specifically, is that I think that it becomes something that you can easily start to chase. Whereas like with peace, like you can always center yourself and you could always, I feel like I'm talking like Ryan right now, but, <laughs> uh, but you can, but you can always like find find yourself and like ground yourself and see how that is better than like trying to 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 maintain the grasp on happiness because there are points in your life or things that are going to happen that are not going to be happy and that are not going to make you happy but I think that it's kind of like coming back to that baseline of this happened the situation happened and now I am in a better better place um, with it because I have found peace with that situation. So yeah, yeah absolutely. Once, once again, super challenging. It's not like, it's just like, yeah. you know, take six hours. I found my peace. Like it's, sometimes it's a little bit, I think it's more gratifying that way. Um, yeah. cause I mean, that's like using my own personal experience. I feel like I was chasing happiness for so long and for so many years that like actually sitting down and like processing everything and like having the ability to see how, that chase was like just detrimental to me I think now that seeing that the peace is what I was really striving for has made me so much I don't want to say better but has made me so much grounded so much more grounded in the things that I do so 100% I I absolutely agree with that I think that it's words are so powerful because of the the emotions and the connotations that we associate with them. And so you're right, like happy, sad, good, bad are things that we all grew up knowing and like knowing having a a, a binary uh, whatever attached to it again, emotion, you know, Mm -hmm. feeling whatever. Um, But I think being able to find a different, a different word, even if you just reframe it, like you said, of, of peace and, you know, maybe taking happiness and turning it into joy. Because when I think about joy, at least personally, I, I feel like I, I feel joy in saying the word, like there is a sunshiny something that, that happens. And I think that those visceral things that get triggered are so much more important than having to, as you were mentioning, chase being happy, right? Like having this goal, staying in this very performative, you know, facade of, of a person. It just, it, and it's enriching to be able to, to have those experiences and really think about that in yourself. And then also how you show up in the world, because I do think when you do the personal work, you automatically show up in a different way. Again, whatever connotation you want to attach with it in the world and people, people can see that. And so then you are ultimately sort of meeting your goal there of, of showing up in a different way for, for somebody else, but you now you, it matches your inside. Well, and I think too, like you had just said, like showing up for someone else, but I think too, with that phrase, just like thinking through my own thought process of like, instead of showing up for others, you show up for yourself. And mm-hmm. I think that too is like the, like we, like the people pleasing, like we always have to, like, we think about other people how are other people going to see me? How are other people going to react to this? When in all actuality, you have absolutely no control how other people are going to see you, how other people are going to control those situations. And, you know, I think once you have that ability to see that, then it's just kind of like, you know, and I joking around about like, I did my very best today. Like that phrase two years ago probably would have been absolute, would have drived me absolutely just up a wall. But now I'm just like, yeah, I, I did my very best today and I will try, try it again tomorrow, mm-hmm. you know, cause some days it's never, it's never going to be like this baseline of like, everything's going to be good. It's, you're going to have some hills and valleys and it's just kind of like how you, 
as much as you celebrate those victories, but also how do you celebrate those challenges to where you got to your victories? So. Totally. That, that, that's fluid too, right? It's, it's, uh, it's a different process. It's not an absolute, it's not I've arrived and therefore I am all of these things. It's a constant maintenance within yourself and a, a reframing of what, how you get to that place purely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I agree 100%. So mm, good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I agree. Good stuff. Um, and I just want to say thank you again for uh, once again, those are all the questions that I have for you and great conversation. Um, mm-hmm. But thank you again, Taylor, for uh, for agreeing to be on the, the podcast. Uh, I appreciate it very much. Um, and don't forget for our followers and listeners at home, um, don't forget to uh, subscribe and like to our YouTube channel, as well as follow us on uh, Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Uh, Taylor, is there anything that you'd like to say before we sign off for the day? Um, I like, thank you too. I really appreciate, again, you having me and being able to, to have this very um just kind of uncut, you know, conversation. I think that it's so, it's so enriching to be able to listen. It's almost like, at least when I listen to it, I don't know if everybody who listens feels this way, but I almost feel like I'm a fly on the wall of somebody else's conversation. And I think that you can learn so much from just being able to unabashedly talk about, you know, have questions that are prompt, but also get into the nitty gritty and, and have, you know, different perspectives and a real, like I said, unfiltered conversation that can go anywhere. I think mm-hmm. there's, there's value in all of that. So I, I really, you know, support what you're doing and I think you're great. Thanks. Nice. Well, thank you. <laughs> well, that, you know, okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah. So thank you again, Taylor. And uh, I hope everyone has a good rest of the day. Bye. Hey.